So my interest is in Neolithic monuments and trying to find out what is behind them, the meaning behind them, why they were built, what their purpose was. And there had to have been a purpose. Um, Richard Bradley says that the planning of monuments and even that of whole settlements often encapsulates a more general perception of space, one which is shaped by mythology as much as topography, mythology being the um, vital word in this. Fact is, we do not have any mythology which dates back to the Neolithic, so how are we going to reconstruct it? We do have mythology associated with the sites. For instance, we have um, ta Irish tales which concern a god called the Dagda, which means the good <coughs> god, who is the bearer of a prestigious weapon and a huge club. <laughs> and um, he is associated with Newgrange, the um, Neolithic site there. So there are, there, are, there are myths which are associated with these sites, but um, do the myths themselves date back to those times? And what is the content of those myths? Now, some of the myths are, are bizarre, and it's very hard to work out what's going on. Let's look at the myth of the Dagda. One of the myths, um, he goes into the camp of these enemy demons who um, represent the winter and um, he, uh, he, he eats a, an enormous amount of porridge and then escapes the enemy's camp and the, and the enemy's daughter follows him and says that she will help him in the un upcoming battle. It's actually a seasonal myth. But try interpreting this. This is the girl has followed him out of the camp. The girl began to mock him then she began wrestling him. She hurled him so that he sunk to the hollow of his rump in the ground. He looked at her angrily and asked, what business did you have, girl, heaving me out of my right of way? This business, to get you to carry me on your back to my father's house. Who is your father? I am the daughter of Index, son of Didonman, she said. Then he moved out of the hole after letting go of the contents of his belly. In other words, he shits in the hole. Um, and then the girl waited for that. The girl waited for that a long time. She wanted to get out that out of the way, obviously. He got up then and took the girl on his back. Then he put three stones in his belt. Each stone fell from it in turn. And it has been said that they were his testicles which fell from it. Three testicles. He is a god after all. The girl jumped on him and then struck him across the rump and her curly pubic hair was revealed. Then the dagger gained a mistress and they made love. The mark remains at Belshaw Strand where they came together. What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> now some of these myths were written down in the early Middle Ages. Are we looking at some frustrated monk, monk just sort of putting forward some strange sexual idea he has? Or is there more meaning behind this? Now, if Ronald Hutton was in the room, he would say, well, we can't actually say that these myths are any earlier than the early Middle Ages. But I'll show that we can perhaps argue that they are. These are the Indo-European languages, and the normal model is that they spread from the Russian steppes, along with horse riding and metal working, in about 3500 BC. Now, following Colin Renfrew's idea, the Anatolian hypothesis, that would be Colin texting now, <laughs> um, he argued that the languages actually came from Anatolia and spread around 6,500 BC along with farming. So these are farming-based mythologies rather than warrior-based mythologies. And it kind of makes sense. The, the ethonym, the name that the, these Indo-European speakers call themselves is the Aryans. It has unfortunate connotations in modern day. But Aryans means the plowman. If you're a warrior society, why would you call yourself the plowman? It's looking more and more, and there are other scientific disciplines which are backing this up, that the Indo-European myths are spreading from the Near East. Um, what I've done in my study is, I won't go into it too much now, is to reconstruct a dendrograph of Indo-European myth and to highlight where certain motifs originate and what, whether they're sort of farming myths or warrior myths. Now, the main um, proto-Indo-European creation myth, as put forward by Bruce Lincoln, suggests that we have a figure called Man who kills a giant called Twin, and it's all very androcentric, there's no women to be seen, there's a sort of ox who occurs in some of the stories, um, that's about it. But actually, looking at these myths um, in real close detail, we find that they only occur over here. All these details actually crumble under 
closer scrutiny. When we look at an, an alternative, we have a male and female pairing who are mating. This is the creation of the world, and then they are rent apart by this chap here. Now this occurs all over the Indo-European world, but actually it seems to be in origin Near Eastern as well. For instance, it occurs in Egyptian myth. We have the, the um, earth god Geb and the sky goddess Nut. They're joined together in this kind of union before time. And then they are split apart by the air god Shu. And this creates the world. And from the void in between, the sun rises. So this is a male-female pairing representing the earth and the sky and the separation. Nut is also the Milky Way but also represents the Nile. So there's a water in the heavens and the water is reflected down below, as we heard about earlier. As above, so below. She's also represented as a white cow, um, known as Mehet Weret, which means the great flood. This is a great flood in heaven and the great flood on earth. And we can see here, this is actually an astronomical image from the Temple of Dendera. This is the goddess Hathor, who is a variant of Nut, eating the sun on the horizon at, the, at sunset and then giving birth to the sun on the eastern horizon the next morning. The sun travels through her body at night. And here we can see the same image with the sun as a solar boat travelling through the body of the white cow to be born the next day. So does this occur anywhere in Celtic myth? Here's Mehed Weret, and here's the, here's the goddess Nut as she appears on every coffin lid. She's associated with the dead. Um, in Egyptian cosmology, you, uh, your soul became a star in the afterlife. So you would enter the body of the goddess, which is the Milky Way, in order to be reborn. <coughs> so this is why she's associated with death. Now, what is the relationship between this and Celtic myth? Well, this is Newgrange in Ireland. Newgrange, as I said, was associated with this figure here. That's actually the that's Sir Nabus Giant, the, the image I'm using there. Um, he is mating with a goddess known as Boyne. Boyne means white cow. She forms the river Boyne. It's named after her. There's a great flood which happens after she walks around a, a well three times and she's drowned in the water. So she is the great flood of the water just as where it is in Egyptian. But she's also associated with the Milky Way, as we will see. The Milky Way is called the Boha Bafinya, which is the road of the white cow. Bruna Boinya is the Irish name for Newgrange, normally translated to palace on the Boyne, but as Boyne means white cow, there's a closer translation. Bru actually means belly or womb, the womb of the white cow. So just as in Egyptian tradition, the coffin represents the womb of the white cow goddess and the Milky Way. So we see that in Irish. And as we, as we know, Newgrange is aligned on the, summer so the winter solstice sunrise. So the ancient Irish were possibly being born from the womb of a white goddess as a white cow, as were the ancient Egyptians. Now, this connection between the cow goddess and tombs is something that we see throughout the Neolithic world. I won't spend too much on this, but it also goes back to the sort of the long barrows, where it can be argued that there is uh, some sort of cow symbolism in these tombs. We have, for instance, head and hooves burials, where um, the bodies of the deceased were placed in structures which may have been covered in cow's hides. It's like going inside the body of the goddess. Same here, we still call these entrance parts of these tombs horns. That's our sort of archaeological term. But it, it goes back to ancient houses, which also um, were associated with Bukrania back in the sort of Vinci cultures in Serbia in sort of 6000 BC, and all the way back to Chadl Hoyuk. Now, the main myth we have from Indo-European times is the rescue of the sun goddess. 
Here she's rescued by um, a couple of twins. This is from Bronze Age Denmark. Um, this is from the Gallihus Drinking Horn, where we see the rescue um, of the cattle, which also represent the sun, by this figure. And I argue that this figure with the three stars above him is possibly related to Orion. Orion is the, the sun res rescuer in a lot of these myths. And this sort of I image persists into later mythology. In Greek mythology, Orion carries Kedalion, who is the son of Hephaestus, on his shoulders. Um, and he, he wanders across the sea trying to get his eyes back. <coughs> it's the same image as the sun appearing over the shoulder of Orion. You see it in St. Christopher bearing Christ over the, over the waters. It's really to do with the placement of Orion next to the Milky Way and the coincidence of the rising of the sun with the rising of Orion at previous points in time. Depends what time that is. If you think it's the winter solstice, Orion carries the sun on his shoulder at the winter solstice in about 10,500 BC. I'm not going to go too much into those dates. Um, otherwise, about 6,000 BC, this happens around the time of the equinox, spring equinox. But anyway, Orion is seen as leading the sun out of the underworld, as rescuing the sun. But there's another protagonist in this myth, and that is a, a strange goddess figure, a strange female figure who, um, as you probably noticed, those with sharp eyes, um, is um, involved in some sort of lewd behaviour. I'm trying to phrase it quite, quite gently. In the myth of Demeter and Persephone, Persephone, who represents um, fertility um, and light, um, is abducted into Hades, and this brings winter to the world. Now, her mother Demeter goes in search of her, and this search is, is not going well. Demeter is in, in a depressed state, and the, and the world is bleak. Until they come to Eleusis, at this point, um, a figure called Baobo, whose name is a sort of, it means belly or womb or, or something equivalent, um, she decides to show her belly or her womb to the goddess, and the goddess laughs. This kind of breaks a spell. The goddess then drinks Kikion, which is this magical drink, and then Persephone appears from the underworld. The, what the goddess does, she somehow charms the sun into being reborn, fertility to return again. The same thing happens in ancient Egypt, where we have the goddess Hathor. When the go sun god Re is, is moribund and is ill, and life is failing, she does an erotic dance before him, and this kind of cheers him up a bit. So, so what's the, what is the meaning of this? We also find it, actually, in Japanese myth. Now, this is an Indo-European, but the, um, Witzel, in his book on the origin of world mythology, is arguing that this has an Indo-European connection, um, perhaps through the Tukarian family tree, but I won't go into that. The sun goddess, Amaterasu, hides in a cave after being insulted. Now, she won't come out, so life in the world um, is get, getting dark and winter is here. How do the gods tempt her out? Well, what would you do? Yeah, of course, you would get an upturned tub, and then you'd get... Um, a goddess called Ame no Uzumi no Mikito, the whirling heavenly forthright woman, to perform a lewd dance on top of it, which includes lifting her skirts. When she lifts her skirts, the gods laugh. Amaterasu, who hides, is hiding in the cave, thinks, what, what are they all laughing at? Pokes her head around the corner of the cave, and then the gods grab her and drag her out. So something is happening, some sort of lewd dance, this is a symbol of something which is happening before the sun is reborn. As for whirling heavenly woman, if we're looking at the same sort of complex as in Egypt, where we have the sky goddess Nut, we can see the Milky Way does its whirling heavenly dance each night. Is it something to do with the Milky Way? Now we have these images of dancers for the goddess Hathor, they seem to be aping this, this kind of bent over position that, that the goddess and the Milky Way um, is, is shown uh, embodying. Now we find the same thing in Denmark in the Bronze Age. Now this figurine here has one of these string skirts on, and we've actually found one of these. 
uh, the uh, burial of the egg fed girl in the Bronze Age in Denmark. She wears a solar disc on her belly. Um, you can't really get the idea from this picture, but that skirt is just made up of bits of string. And if she was doing that dance, it wouldn't leave much to the imagination. We're possibly seeing the same imagery as in Egyptian. Here we have uh, an equivalent of an Egyptian solar boat, and here we have this kind of leaping goddess figure. So are we seeing the equivalent of this sky goddess with the sun on the womb ready to be reborn? Was the egg-fed girl, for instance, a priestess doing some sort of ritual dance um, to bring back the fertility of the land, to bring the sun back to, to birth? Now, there is some archaeology in this talk. Um, I started looking at Stonehenge, looking at whether there was evidence of these myths at ritual sites. So we've got the image in the Milky Way, and we've got um, cattle skulls, etc. So <coughs> plotting on the first couple of phases of Stonehenge, <coughs> we see certain artifacts appearing, cattle skulls and chalk balls. Oh, there's another one there. And we can see there's, these are associated with the entrances and where we can discern the sex, they tend to be female. As if going into the, into the circle is going into the body of the, the cow goddess again, perhaps. <coughs> and here's your balls again, appearing. Okay. Third phase, sorry, phase 2A, same thing is happening. But what we're seeing is we've got objects associated with this entrance down here. This is the south-southwest entrance, which in the later phases is closed up. Why is it closed up and what's its importance? I thought I'd look at it astronomically. Is there an alignment from the centre of Stonehenge through that entrance? Well, later when, the, when this is closed up, we do have another alignment down here. But it's not quite the same alignment. Now there's nothing in the landscape to suggest what it's aligned on, so perhaps it's something that is moving. Now the only thing that moves at this kind of rate um, is probably the stars. So I started looking at other sites um, where we had similar orientations, which is just off south. Now I, won't go, I haven't got time to go into all of them, but um, these are the ones that I've looked at so far. Some in Orkney as well, which I won't talk about today. But they seem to have this same orientation. Now, what is that orientation to? There's only one thing down there. Um, it's not got nothing to do with the sun or the moon because it's outside the rising and setting points of the sun and the moon. It's a southern cross in the Milky Way. Most of us won't have seen this because it's no longer visible in our skies. Um, it sort of lost visibility probably about 2000 BC. It was right on the horizon at that point. So we had the rising and setting of these, which were the, some of the brightest stars in the sky. Now that's, we, we, construct, we construct them nowadays as a cross, but that's pretty a cultural influence from Christianity. Um, my argument is that um, in prehistoric times they would have seen it as a diamond or a lozenge. Now because this changes its setting point over time, it might explain why it was lost from view from that first viewpoint, and then a new viewpoint has to be put here rather than dig into the bank at Stonehenge. We do see there's correspondence between the setting of this star and the position of the Milky Way and how that actually reflects the location of the Avon on the ground. As above, so below. The waters of the heavens and the waters on Earth are somehow reflected. So what's this got to do with our lewd dance? Well, if the Milky Way is the goddess and the goddess has to have a womb, and this is what I'm arguing um, we see here, there's a number of Neolithic figurines which have this same imagery at the belly. Now this is the, I'm arguing, this pattern is based on the Southern Cross. And the important thing is that in the past this um, constellation rose at exactly the same point that the midwinter sun rose. Oh, there's another, another couple of things there. So basically, over the, over the night of the um, solstice, 
we see a certain number of things happening in the sky. Orion will rise with the Milky Way kind of on its shoulder, will be pushed down, then the Milky Way will ring the sky, the stars of crooks will appear, and then the sun will rise. Or to put it another way, using Irish myths, she hurled him so that he sank to the hull of his rump to the ground. This business to get you to carry me on your back to my father's house. Here we see Orion with the Milky Way on his back. And he put three stones in his belt. As each stone fell from it in turn, it has been said that they were his testicles which fell from it. And there we see at Stonehenge these same chalk balls. The girl jumped on him and struck him across the rump and her curly pubic hair was revealed. Then the dagger gained a mistress and they made love. The mark remains at Beltral Strand where they came together. Let's start looking closer at myth to see if it tells us more about the ancient sky. Thank you.